is we are very fortunate to have four distinguished uh, guests to sit on our panel. The title of the panel is basically, oh, no, what is the title of the panel? Okay, <laughs> a, a view, a view from the industry, um, and also the tech transfer. So uh, let me quickly introduce the uh, the panelists, um, starting from uh, your left. So first is Eddie Siman. Um, Eddie Siman is the IT director at Inter Intradeco uh, Apparel. He is also an angel investor and influencer focused on the future of augmented and virtual reality. And then next to him is Jonathan Fay, and Jonathan is a principal software engineer at Microsoft Analog AI, working on HoloLens and Windows Mixed Reality. He is the co-creator of Worldwide Telescope and serves as the architect um, for the Worldwide Telescope for the American Astronomical Society. And sitting next to him is Shanna Skolnick, a co-finder, CEO, and also the creative mastermind of a technology company called Laptecker. And last but not least um, is Michael Amori, and Michael is the co-finder um, and the CEO of the Virtualistics, a Caltech and also JPL startup on the interaction of data visualization, analysis, and also virtual and armament reality. So please welcome this as a panel. Since the, uh, the, our you know, event schedule you know, did not really accommodate having them to give a presentation, so I'm going to ask each panel to start by giving a brief um, introduction and also uh, a bit, perhaps a, a story and also tell about the views on VR and their experience. Okay, we'll start with uh, Eddie. Uh, good afternoon. Okay, I think this is working. All right, it's working. Um, so I think, you know, I'm gonna spend about just a couple minutes, and what I'm gonna try to do is talk about maybe things that haven't been discussed, uh, you know, before, just to give you guys a, a sense of, you know, what, the, what I think the future of VR and AR is specifically in terms of the web. Um, and when I say the web, I mean, you know, what we commonly experience what, you know, the most common applications that we use on the web, you know, which I would say for the most part sort of e-commerce uh, and social, right? Or at least those are the big players. Um, so I think that, you know, it, there's, it's a fairly good assumption that the web is not gonna be 2D forever. Um, and I should probably preface this by saying that a, a lot of my ideas kind of stem from conversations with, with George, who's been thinking about this probably since like 1973, um, but, so I think that's important to know, but it's pretty clear that the web's gonna be 3D. So the question is, if the web is 3D, how do we navigate that? What is the cursor for a 3D web? I think that's gonna be avatars. Um, maybe that might seem a little strange now, but I think it's sort of the natural evolution of how we interact with the web. Um, it doesn't make sense for a cursor to be your personification in a 3D world or in a VR environment. That's just ludicrous. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Plus, we've had, you know, we've had decades of virtual worlds which have shown us that people can interact in a virtual space. Um, you know, like we just heard a, f a few minutes ago, 6,000 people in the same virtual space and, you know, running on, what, one CPU core, right? And we're not even talking about the power of Azure or AWS. Um, so I think we could kind of start from the assumption that we're going to have avatars that are going to be our cursor in the, in the 3D web. And then the next question is sort of, you know, how is this 3D web um, going to be different from what we have now? Um, I think we're going to see something really interesting, which is that the new web, this 3D web, which of course will also be a VR web if it can, you know, render at 90 uh, you know, frames per second, and, and if you have, you know, the right browser and all of that, I think that what you're going to see is a kind of a return to things that reflect reality. So if you remember sort of the border stores that are no longer exist, but they were, you know, huge bookstores, and this is where sort of this idea of the endless aisle, you know, came about, and you have 
uh, the endless aisle in e-commerce uh, where you can buy whatever you want, right? You have this long tail of products where there's the ones that 90% of people buy and then 10% of people people buy you know, one of every small little thing that nobody has ever heard of. Um, I think that you're gonna basically put on a VR headset or, or, or open a, a web uh, VR browser like a Mozilla a browser which already supports it and I think that you are going to see a bookstore or you're gonna see uh, something that, that looks like a store in real life and you're going to be walking through that store um, and the metrics uh, that are going to be um, taken by retailers, by consumer packaged goods companies, are going to be very similar to the metrics that we take now, like foot traffic, for example. You know, companies like Walmart uh, obsess about foot traffic. Like how long, you know, like I, I work for an apparel retailer, apparel, uh, you know, supplier, and the big question is like, how long do people spend in the apparel section? Well, that's the same question we're going to be asking, but in virtual reality. How long are people spending in the apparel section? I mean, how different is that from the existing web? It's completely different. Um, so I just kind of want to give you an idea that of where I think that the web is going. I think it's a little bit counterintuitive uh, because we sort of think of the web as being different from real life. But as the web becomes 3D, I think inherently it has to become much more similar to real life because we're going to want it to look like what we're, what we're used to. Um, and I do think that avatars are going to be our cursor. Uh, in that environment. So I'll leave it at that. That's sort of just an intro to kind of where I think things are going and we could talk more about that. Um, I, I guess I'm different uh, from some of the other panelists in that uh, the industry uh, when I, uh, that I come from, uh, at the time that I got into this, um, we were doing something called Worldwide Telescope at Microsoft Research and I collaborated uh, with uh, um, with uh, a number of, of people, including George, who uh, graciously uh, took one of the first um, Oculus prototypes that were sent from the um, Kickstarter campaign and mailed it to me up in Seattle to allow me to get Worldwide Telescope ported to it. Um, and while we were one of the very first uh, astronomy applications in that environment, uh, we still aren't shipping a, a complete um, VR uh, or mixed reality experience dedicated in that environment in Worldwide Telescope even many years later, uh, partially because I think that the, the development of, of, it's such a very different space um, to recreate the functionality and the uh, feature set and the capability that it has and translate it into something that's actually purely designed for uh, the, the modality of, of being immersed in that, especially with controllers. And part of that is with the introduction of controllers, it becomes much more possible to um, be more engaged in that environment. But it, it's, uh, I believe that the, uh, to really use the uh, type of paradigms that people are used to in real life, and that's what the virtual re uh, world should provide, you're using their experience and all of the intuition they have and the things that they've trained with. And so trying to just take existing computer paradigms that they're used to on the desktop or you've engineered into a, a maybe a very capable mouse desktop version of that and try to translate it instantly into VR is just not gonna be successful. And so rather than just do something that was a flash in the pan, I've been taking a long game on it and um, we'll talk more about the demo I'm gonna do later, but um, um, that's, uh, so uh, moving from astronomy and VR into uh, working with augmented reality in, in HoloLens, um, the challenges of astronomy have really kind of helped uh, uh, corporate world understand how to really uh, take very expensive situations like an astronaut's time in space or designing a billion dollar vehicle and that, that, that you can get economy uh, return on investment uh, with a very small economy of scale on those type of solutions, but they can be patterns that can be then rolled out broadly towards uh, more industry. Uh, like for instance, um, I was uh, uh, coming home to get my septic tank pumped. Uh, in Seattle, we have a lot of septic systems. Maybe you don't have that in California. But I pulled my whole lens out of my trunk, and the guy who, who's the truck driver and pumper there 
asked me what it was, and I showed him a brief demonstration of this koi pond sitting inside my garage. And he looked at that and said, you know, I could use something like this to tell me where all the utilities are underground and where to dig for the septic. And, and this guy who poop, pumps poop for a living got it <laughs> instantly. <laughs> but it had to be a completely intuitive interface that he could just use and not something adapted from some desktop. Anyway, I'll end it with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also a little bit different from some of the other presenters in the sense that my work has been focused on earth science data, GIS data. Uh, contrary to some current popular belief, the earth is actually a planet in space. Uh, so I think it is relevant that data is data after all. And what we're looking at is data that's collected from a sphere. So some of the early work that we did at NAFTECA was literally just taking climate model output and things that are typically seen in a 2D display and, ra oh, sorry, and wrapping it around you. So being able to look at data in that satellite view, but being able to look at it almost like a convex earth around you was able to provide people a very unique perspective that typically you would only get from a globe with the difference that you can literally just turn your head and see this information around you. In a typical Mercator projection, we see the Earth in a very distorted format, so whether it's the continents or the poles. This is useful both from a scientific perspective but also from an outreach perspective. And some of the early uh, presentations of the data that we did, for example, at the American Geophysical Union Conference, we got a broad spectrum of people who either had a science background or different, didn't, and many of them, their first reaction was just, wow, I didn't know that Antarctica was so small because we see it spread out across the bottom of the map. And so on a fundamental level, many people, and especially decision makers and politicians, lack this very, very basic understanding of the Earth. So we've been using virtual reality to uh, sort of bridge that gap and between the data itself and then being able to understand it. So that was early work. And then more recently, we've been working with NASA's Earth Science Technology Office using the interactive uh, and immersive systems, so HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, to look at much more complex point cloud data. So we've been able to take data, for example, from NASA's global precipitation measurement and actually allow users to fly down into the point cloud itself inside of the hurricane. This provides a very unique perspective and gives you potentially some insight into the influence of the terrain onto why did the hurricane go in a certain direction? Why was rainfall more concentrated here? What impact did that have on inland flooding? So we're looking at VR as a way, not just for mission modeling, but actually post-event analysis. So being able to reconstruct what happened and then use this data from uh, disparate sources. So even bringing in population data, insurance data, looking at that with some of the science data and seeing if that can drive better decision making and better preparedness for future events. Hi, so Virtualytics, okay, very loud. Virtualytics is a, a startup that came out of research done at Caltech. Uh, George is one of the co-founders of, of that and uh, helped out with a lot of the ideas behind it, and Scott as well. Uh, the, the technology behind it uh, tries to solve two key problems that we see in data analytics right now. So one is the what I would call the data exploration problem, and the other one is the data collaboration or communication problem. So. If you think about it, every journey in data starts out with data exploration. And that always takes a lot of time and is difficult to do, especially when the data is complex, so especially when the data is multidimensional. And most interesting data in the world is multidimensional. The other part that's always required in every journey through data is collaboration and communication, because after all, if you find something interesting in the data, you want other people to understand it. And that part is also very difficult when you're limited to 2D graphs uh, that you can send to people through a PDF uh, in order to explain, again, complex data. So we think at, at Virtualytics that VR can help solve the data exploration issue and the data collaboration and communication issue through the use of virtual reality. 
And virtual reality helps in two very important ways, we think. One, on the data exploration part, it allows you to see many dimensions of the data interacting together at the same time. And again, as other people on the panel said, VR tries to replicate aspects of the real world. In the real world, when we walk around a garden, we don't just see the X, Y position of the flowers. We see the X, Y, Z position, the color, the texture, the transparency, the opacity. We see how the flowers are moving in the wind relative to each other. And we can perceive all of that immediately because evolution has made us capable to do that. Well, the same thing can be done with abstract data. So we can encode the data with all of these attributes, which are the same attributes with which we analyze the physical world. And that allows us to see patterns in the data that happen across many dimensions at the same time. So that's how VR can help with the data exploration issue. And now VR can also help with the data collaboration communication issue because if several avatars can be inside a shared virtual office and look at the data together and interact with the data together, that's a much richer experience than sending PDFs of 2D graphs. So you could have a colleague in Singapore, another one in London. The three of you are sitting together analyzing data in a virtual office through your avatars. So those are the, the basic uh, big things that VR is bringing to data analytics. And we're currently working with about 15 Fortune 500 companies that range across different verticals from finance, to biotech, to retail, and they all have something in common, which is what we just spoke about. They have complex data, and they have trouble exploring it, getting to grips with what's going on with the data, and they have trouble collaborating and communicating the insights that they find in the data. So uh, at the end of the event, we will have a demo in the back of the technology if anybody wants to try it. Great. Thank you very much. Let's give them a hand of applause. Um, I would like to just open it up um, for dialogue, discussions, and questions and answer for the audience. So um, can I have the mic? OK. No, you can go ahead. Take this one, please. Okay. Would be that, um, so I hope that people agree with me that when I, when I say that NASA's biggest partners in, in science communication are science museums, planetariums, observatories, all of that stuff. And, and I think it was actually Parker who mentioned that VR right now doesn't scale very well. Um, you know, you're talking about one or two collaborators around the world, but if we're trying to teach, you know, classrooms of kids, Gen a generation of, of new explorers if we're trying to inspire them using VR and AR. Um, what kind of pathways can science museums use to access the content that you're producing, even if they don't have the hardware per se, if they have existing hardware like Science on a Sphere, for example, for Earth data, or if they have a planetarium for Worldwide Telescope, how can they access your content? start with this because it's something that we've thought about a lot and have worked with education as well. So I think you want to think about using VR not just for when you have users at your physical site, but also how can you prepare them for the experience that they're going to have, and then how can you send them home with some sort of post-experience um, enrichment exercises, whether that's in their classroom or whether it's at home. Also think about the fact that when cell phones came onto the market, very few people had them. It only took a few years for it to become ubiquitous and everyone had them. Now we have smartphones. So that is the way that we are going with VR and AR devices. They will become a part of people's lives. So you need to think five years into the future where you aren't limited to the fact that very few people have the devices and thinking about an experience that isn't just when you're at the museum, but how can you involve that user, that child uh, from their classroom and then to once they get home. A few, I, I work a lot with uh, uh, various planetarium organizations and um, 
as you said, Worldwide Telescope runs in full dome mode, and so that was um, one of our, our first outreach to the museum community. Uh, eventually, we also had a, sort of a kiosk mode, and uh, places like Morrison Planetarium in, in uh, San Francisco has a number of uh, supporting kiosks for the different shows that they do. Uh, that allow them to bring the data in and, and bring in real-time earth science and astronomy data uh, to visualize that way. But one of the key things I thought could sort of transform planetariums, um, if you look at the number of planetariums in the country and you look at the number of people who are not served by a planetarium uh, in their area because they're too far away from one or they can't get a bus into it or they don't have the budget for it, imagine if setting up uh, a few machines in a library at a school and allowing kids to be able to schedule some time where they can come in, put on a VR headset, and the next thing they know, they're popping out of a magic school bus space shuttle along with students from all over the country um, that are being led by a, um, uh, a, a, um, a museum hired you know, at the museum with the content created by the, that planetarium, um, a professional educator who is, uh, knows how to per, uh, bring those people along for the virtual reality ride and take them through this immersive planetarium show um, that then they're able to see the avatars of the other students, interact with them, interact, ask questions, point at different objects, and have a, a completely different type of experience that wouldn't even be possible in the planetarium, but leverages that expertise and the content creation from that. And so that's, that's a, a one way that, uh, um, that VR can be used to sort of uh, um, distribute the planetarium remotely. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, th those, are, those are really interesting approaches. I mean, I don't, I don't have any personal experience with you know, sort of building after planetariums, but what I can tell you is sort of what I would want, um, kind of you know channeling my uh, my five year old son and thinking of you know what might he get excited playing with. Um, I know that you know if there's a gravitational wave detection, I don't want to see a 2D presentation when they uh, when they present when they present the fact that they found it. Um, I want to see it in VR, um, and I want to be able to get. A star and make it smaller to the point that it becomes a black hole, and then we get another one and put it next to it and create a gravitational wave. And I want to be able to see that in VR, and I want to be able to talk to my teacher about it. And maybe I'm 12, 13, 14 years old, and why shouldn't you know someone that age be talking about gravitational waves? I mean, the concept might be complicated, but in VR, it's just a picture. It's just something that you can play with, right? Um, so, you know, we have kind of this incredible uh, new discoveries that are coming out, you know, in the field of astronomy and, and, and gravitational, uh, you know, physics, and yet the way in which we visualize them is so silly, you know, and it's kind of frustrating because you think like, oh my God, this is such a big deal, um, and yet the visualization is like, if you, the visualization, if you put it in any planetarium or museum, like I live in Miami, if, if we put it in the Science Museum, nobody would even stop to look at it um, because they'd be like, what is that twirling weird thing? But if you could see it in VR or AR and you could play with it and you could just say, well, this is one astronomical unit or this is one you know, star unit, you could make it bigger, make it bigger, make it smaller, it's a neutron star, it's a, it's a black hole. It's like, how hard is that to do? Really, I mean, any game designer could do that. Um, so, I mean, I think that's something that I would love to see NASA working on. I mean, I'm not that far from Kennedy Space Center, so if you make it, I can, you know, I'll go take my kids and we'll try it out. Hi, my name is Kit. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, one of the, the terms I've heard used a lot is collaboration. People are really using VR and AR as spaces where multiple people can collaborate. I can see and understand the idea where there's one driver of the main UI, and what I'm wondering about is a vision where there are multiple drivers, multiple users using the interface, and more than one person being in control or in charge of it. So how do we work to collaborate in ways that give multiple people control without creating chaos? That's a very good question. So actually in that's the problem that we've been trying to tackle in our, in our software. And so we can have the mode where there is 
one person who guides the others, so kind of a presenter. And by the way, we can have a lot more than just a couple of people. We can have an audience mode where many people are sitting in, so it's not, it is scalable to some extent. Um, but we can also have a mode where everyone is an active participant, and there you just have to have some ground rules, just like you have in real life, where you don't want someone talking over other people or standing in front of you so that you don't see what's going on. It's just, you just have to uh, create the rules whereby when somebody, we look at data for example, when somebody is pointing at something in a particular visualization, the other people are not allowed to go and uh, you know, change that, okay? So people kind of take turns, but that's just like you do in, you know, polite people do in real life. So it, it is something that you can actually achieve and I think the VR works perfectly well f even, even in that context. Um, in, the interest, in, the, in the interest of time, so I would like to take one more question before we transition to the demo. <coughs> Hi, I'm David. I work in the technology transfer uh, group at uh, JPL and affiliated with Caltech. I was wondering if the panelists could just tell us a little bit about the genesis of your companies, whether it was started from um, a market need that you observed or uh, exposure to a particular technology, uh, perhaps, uh, and perhaps an interesting story maybe about some challenge or obstacle that was really critical that you overcame and how you did that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, the um, the genesis of our of our company was as follows: um, uh, George and Scott and Chiro had been working on a way to be able to visualize and understand their own scientific data in a novel way, and they've been doing that for many years. Now I um, I am a graduate of Caltech, but I ended up selling out and going and working in finance. So I went and worked on Wall Street for about 12 years, and I was dealing a lot with uh, complex data, and I was in charge of a trading group that basically took a lot of uh, trading decision based on, on uh, data. And I, I was fortunate enough to meet George through a social event, and I saw what he was working on, and I thought to myself, okay, this would be really useful to someone doing the job I was doing, and anybody else, in business who has multi-dimensional data. That's where the idea for the company came. And so we then worked with the Caltech uh, Technology Transfer Office to, to make it happen. In terms of what, are, what were some of the biggest obstacles? Well, there have been so many obstacles, but if I had to like pick one, I think that uh, even though you know Caltech is an amazing place, probably one of the most amazing places there are, and a lot of talented people, a lot of great things. One thing that's lacking in this area is the amount of capital. So unlike um, our friends in San Francisco, we don't have this easy access to these huge venture capital companies. I think that's one, that's one issue. And the day that uh, you know, Los Angeles can solve that, then LA will have a huge tech ecosystem like LA because it has all the characteristics to be really successful. But that was one big hurdle, and that's one thing that I hope will, will change in the future. So my story is a little bit different. Uh, I have a very eclectic background. Uh, I was creative. I had worked as an artist. I taught myself graphic design, started designing websites when websites were first a thing. Then that evolved into multimedia presentations. And so I worked as an independent contractor, if you will, for a very long time before deciding to kind of formalize that into a company and see if I could grow it beyond just work for myself. Um, that being said, I'm really fascinated between the intersection of science, technology, and art. And I think that there's a huge space for exploration there, which is one of the reasons that I'm so excited about virtual reality, is I think that it really brings a lot of those elements together. In terms of the company, um, when I got started, again, I had you know, more design work and that evolved over time. I eventually brought on a co-founder and we started doing a lot of work with cloud computing when AWS was just really 
getting started. We're located just outside of Washington, D.C., so there are a lot of federal contracting opportunities, and we've been able to grow through small business subcontracting, being able to go in and provide niche expertise to large primes. So that started off more in the cloud realm, and then that has expanded into sort of innovation in general, virtual reality, uh, data visualization being one of those areas. Uh, in terms of our you know, work with NASA, the way that we were able to grow that really was uh, creating a little demo around this idea of using virtual reality for Earth science and being able to go in very early on, uh, early 2015, before some of the commercially uh, available headsets had come out onto the market and show some key people this idea, and they were able to give us just very small incremental rounds of funding. So that would be maybe some advice, I guess, for people who are thinking about getting started is, you know, you don't have to go out and get a huge amount of funding up front. You do have to find somebody who's gonna be an internal ally who believes in your ideas and then maybe pitch them very small incremental steps. And that's how we've been able to grow our work with virtual reality inside of NASA. Um, one challenge though, of course, is getting to that point where it is a longer term effort um, with more dedicated funding so that we can really take this beyond just proof of concept R&D and really create the tool that we think would be very useful um, for GIS users. Well, we ran out of time for this session, so let's give the panelists another round of applause.